By the way, do you know why we sing that? Anybody tell me what the scripture reference is for your goodness is running after me? Psalm 23. Goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And, you know, most of us are in such a hurry that the goodness has to be running after us, right? But it's such a joy to know that goodness is running after us, running after us to keep up and to make sure that goodness is never far behind when we're here. Your goodness is running after it's running after me. Your goodness is running now, it's running now for me. If my life lay down and surrender now, I give you everything.
anybody have any announcements that need to be made? Or do you want to make them later? Sounds fine. Sounds fine. Well, I'm really glad you're here today. Because I don't like singing by myself. And the worship team is great. We had a great time this morning. And I was just in utter awe that God moved Jim away so that I could lead worship today. No. Uh, <laughs> Jim, is, Jim is involved. I want to let you guys know. Jim is involved, leading, or, uh, involved in worship down at Kamloops. Why would somebody need to go to Kamloops to worship God? But apparently there's a gathering down there. And it's quite a, fan, uh, quite a fantastic gathering of people that are there this morning so so he's he's a is it gathering i think it's i i believe it's a gathering of first nations brothers and sisters in the lord is that right from kind of like all over is it just bc or is it like all over every all over anybody who wanted to come from nova scotia was allowed to apparently anyway great stuff people up from washington yeah i understand the borders open so there were people who could make it up and it's pretty exciting, yeah. Oh, the Jacksons came, wow. Those of you that remember, if you can remember way, way back to when Sunrise Band used to come through, that's Ken Jackson. Ken and Randy Jackson ran the Sunrise Band. I think, actually, I think the Lord was running the band, but uh, Kenny and Randy were allowed to come along. So it was great. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have. So you may be sitting here this morning wondering if you're in the right spot, especially once I start st talking. People naturally sort of feel that way. You can imagine what it was like for my students on Wednesday. They sat down and I started talking. And first of all, I told them that I'm glad that they signed up for biology. Well, they, were si they had signed up for critical thinking, so they began to look worried at that particular point. And then when I told them, though, it was really a class in critical thinking, but I kept talking, they started getting even more worried. <clears throat> but if you're not sure, I did, I did. I was talking about my cell phone. Is that biology? <clears throat> anyway, so this song is for you. If you're not sure who you really are, and you're not sure whether or not you belong here, you need to know that in this fellowship, all belong here, all means A-L-L, -L. all, doesn't mean any exceptions, okay? When you're not sure who you really are, all you feel is the shame of your scars, and you have more wounds than you can count, open your eyes, look all around, you aren't alone, this is your home. Come and remember who you are here. Do this to remember who I am. Come and remember you belong. don't know how to forgive when locked doors seem like the only way to live and you've got more questions than you can count open your eyes look all around you aren't alone this is your home
remember who you are here Do this to remember who I am Come and remember you belong here All belong I have been crucified with my Lord And now I live because He lives in me The life I live in flesh I song before. It's uh, only about a little over 40 years old. Um, but I don't think I've done it here before. Anyway, um, so there's a couple things you need to know. One, it's okay to learn how to sing it by singing it. Okay, so try, we'll try that again. We're going to do it, the whole thing through. Um, but then the other thing you need to know is that in the last line where it says, I have been led to rest, it's okay if you kind of mispronounce the led to rest. Like, I have been laid to rest in God. When you're crucified, it's okay then to be laid to rest like Jesus was, right? So anyway, that's how part of how the two verses go together. And if you read Galatians 2, if you read on past verse 20, you realize that there's a lot of the later verses uh, in the song. I have been crucified with my Lord And now I live because He lives in me The life I live in flesh I i 
satisfied with my you 
are hurting. Many of us are suffering. Many of us are living through days of uncertainty. And we acknowledge you alone hold the answers. And it's, it hurts at times when you don't share them with us. We would be less than honest to say that we don't get angry from time to time and we don't get puzzled and we don't get discouraged and we don't get down at various times because of the way you seem to work or the way you don't seem sometimes to work in the world. The sadness, the suffering, the pain and the poverty are overwhelming. And the more we become aware of that, the more it weighs on us. Lord God, we need to find our rest in you. Our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. And Lord, we don't act, ask you to act in the sense that you, in the sense that we act, to take care of a deficiency or to try to become better. You are perfect. And perfect means unchangeable. The brother of our Lord said that there's no shadow of turning with you. There's no shifting light. There's no, there's no changeability. And yet, God, our God, you change everything. When we wake up in the morning to the time that we lay our head down at night, you make our lives. Lord God, we need you. We praise you and we bless you in this time. We worship you. You alone are God. We bow before you. May God be blessed forever and ever. Amen. Let's take a break. An ocean of sorrow is under my skin. Even the ocean eventually meets with the sand Sorrow on sorrow I'm waiting Heavy I'm anticipating Trusting the current will carry me
like a stone in the wasteland I was useless until you lifted high in your mercy out of sorrow and made new oh this mind is team for doing a great job as usual and uh, just um, want to uh, good to be back I've been gone for a couple of weeks so it's uh, good to be back and in uh, in the saddle as it were and I want to thank uh, Pastor Paul especially who covered uh, both Sundays for me especially an emergency last Sunday the guest speaker couldn't uh, was ill and wasn't able to show up and so he did both Sundays so he had to rearrange everything so uh, they're on vacation right now I think for a couple of weeks so I want to be thankful for that for sure thanks to him uh, a couple of quick announcements before we uh, carry on here. Um, King's Corner, the Sunday School uh, time, is going to start up next week. And uh, there's preschool class, and then there's uh, grades 2 to 6. And I think there might even be something available for youth. I'm not 100% sure on that one. But uh, that starts next Sunday, so that'll be good if you bring your kids and what have you. And uh, just a reminder that life groups are in process, and we're hoping to start up maybe one or two new ones. If you would like to be part of a, a life group, like during the week and what have you, and you're not, and you know that you don't see anything that uh, perhaps is, that you're is appealing to you or what have you, and you've got any ideas whatsoever, just please talk to me, and I sort of help coordinate that stuff. And uh, we'd love to see if we can get something together that would be accommodating to more people. It's always good to get together during the week and uh, be able to share our lives together. And that's great. Let's go to prayer and. Um, just, um, you know, just remember um, uh, our people in prayer and all the different challenges that we face. And uh, let's just do that right now. Father, we thank you for your uh, wonderful um, love for us, uh, that you're always there no matter what we're going through. And uh, Lord, we all have trials and tribulations in our lives. Some of us have bigger struggles than others, that's for sure. And uh, we know some of them, Lord, physical challenges, um, relational situations, uh, hardships at work and, and finances and what have you, Lord. We just want to bring our people before you now and pray that you would be close to them and minister to them and give them strength and wisdom at this time. Lord, it's a tough time with COVID. You know, the rules are always changing and, and the situation is always changing. We've, it's been a long journey. And it's been an emotional strain uh, for everyone, to one degree or another. And so, Father, we just pray for continued strength in that area. And we pray, Lord, that, uh, you know, we're, we're thankful for the freedom we have in the church in terms of uh, what we're able to do in, in spite of the, the situation. 
We pray that that might continue, that we can have that uh, needed fellowship uh, with you and with each other. And we want to ask that you would do that for us. Now, Lord, bless the message as we look in the book of Hebrews and uh, ask that you speak to our hearts. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. The, the message today is called uh, Christ Restores Our Humanity. And uh, it's based on Hebrews uh, 2, 5 to 11. And perhaps I can uh, read that um, for you at this time. It is not uh, to angels that he has subjected the world to come, about which we are speaking. But there is a place where someone has testified, What is mankind that you are mindful of them? A son of man that you even care for him. You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned them with glory and honor. And you put everything under their feet. Putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. Yet at the present time, we do not see everything subject to them. But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. And both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family so Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. Now, we don't know uh, who wrote the book of Hebrews. There's no author uh, attached to it. But we do know it was addressed to a group of, of Jewish Christians um, that uh, you know, accepted Christ, were in the Jewish faith and accepted Christ. We don't know where they were. Were they in Jerusalem? Were they in Rome? Whatever. We don't know. And uh, we know that at least a good portion of them we're starting to drift back into the Jewish faith and back into the Jewish religious practices. And Jesus was becoming less and less relevant to them. And, um, you know, some were coming to the place and thinking, well, you know what, I think angels were, were, are, are considered are higher and, and, and more valuable and, and more precious than Jesus is. And they were almost like worshiping angels. And, and Jesus was beginning, they had a very low view of Jesus. So in chapter 1, we're told that Jesus, uh, the author is trying to tell the people, look, Jesus is far more important than angels. Come on. As a matter of fact, Jesus is God Almighty in the flesh. We're told that in verse Hebrews 1, verse 3, right at the beginning of the chapter, the sun is, look at this, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Jesus is, 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 is the exact representation of God. He's the radiance of God's glory. He is sustaining everything just by his powerful word. No angel can do that. This is God. And then in Hebrews 1, verse 10, he goes on to say, referring to Jesus, and he quotes Psalm 102, uh, 25, which speaks about and talks about Jehovah God. Listen, he says, this is talking about Jesus. In the beginning, Lord, you, Jehovah God, you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. He's declaring that Jesus is God. He's certainly much higher than an angel. But you know, the Hebrew, uh, these, these Christians uh, were also had a lo not only a low view of Jesus, they had a low view of human beings. You know, uh, Genesis 1 uh, tells us that human beings were created in the image of God, in the likeness of God. And uh, it's we were designed to be such a way that, if, say, an angel came down and looked at a human being and said, oh, so that's what God's like. We were created in the image of God. So it's no surprise that these Hebrew Christians thought that human beings were lower than angels. If, if Jesus, they thought Jesus was lower than angels, certainly human beings would be lower than angels too. They had a high view of angels. And then we're, uh, so he tells, he tells them in Hebrews 1.14, no, 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 no. Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? We're not here to serve angels. Angels are here 
to serve human beings. So the Hebrews Christians, these Christians, had, were drifting from the, from the Word of God, and they had no concept of the dignity of Jesus, and no concept, really, of their own dignity. So at the beginning of, in our reading this morning, Hebrews 2, verse 5, we're told another reason why human beings who have experienced God's salvation have greater worth and value than angels. And the reason is this. In the world to come, when Jesus returns and sets up the kingdom in fullness, it is human beings that will be rulers on earth, not angels. We're, holding, we're told in Hebrews 2, 5 to 8. It is not to angels that he subjected the world to come. No. So who will? Who will rule in the world to come if not angels? Anything in, in red, by the way, is my own words. But there is a place where someone has testified, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? A son of man, you care for him. You made them a little lower than the angels. Then you crowned them with glory and honor and put everything under their feet. In putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. So eventually we'll have a new world order when Christ returns. And that's good to know, isn't it? All this pain and sorrow and what have you, eventually someday is going to go. It's be gone. And who will rule in this coming world? Not angels, but human beings. You see, human beings were not only created in the image of God, they were created to rule for God. We're told that in Genesis 1.26, right at the beginning. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Why? Why were we made like God? So that they may rule over it has always been the intention of God in creating human beings that they would rule over his entire creation for him. What dignity. And then um, in Hebrews 2, 6 to 8, the writer of Hebrews is, is really, he's quoting King David in Psalm 8, where uh, David said human beings were crowned with glory and honor. And when you read Psalm 8, and you may be familiar with it, I don't know, it's a, a popular psalm, you see that David is absolutely stunned that God has elevated human beings to such a high status it seems almost believable, unbelievable to him. So here is ex his exact words in Psalm 8, 3 to 6. Let's take a quick look at it here. David says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers the moon, the stars, which you've put in place. You know, he looked at the universe. He said, wow, God's done all that. Amazing, awesome God. Then he says, what is mankind that you're mindful to even think of them? Human beings that you would even care for us. We're puny in comparison to your power. Again, he says, you've made them a little lower than the angels. Now, why, did, why does he say that we're made a little bit lower than the angels when, when he's trying to argue the fact that we're greater than angels? Well, I think in the sense, initially, we are lower than angels. Why? Because we're subject to sin, we're subject to death, and we're restricted to the physical realm, whereas angels, are, they're spiritual, they, they're not subject to the physical, they're, they're not caught up in sin and death and what have you. So in that sense, they're higher right now. But then it goes on to say, but we are to be crowned, we crown them with glory and honor, and you made them rulers over the works of your hands he says, there's, a, there's that phrase. It's a popular phrase that's found in the New Testament many times. You put everything, everything under their feet. Now, the Apostle Paul says that someday human beings will even judge and rule over angels. In Corinth, there was a church that had all sorts of problems in Corinth. All sorts of problems. Lots of issues. At, at, at war with each other, suing each other, whatever. He says, why can't you guys figure it out yourself? Why can't you just learn how to uh, deal with the conflict you have instead of going to the courts and, and what have you? He says, don't you know that we will someday judge angels? That's the dignity we have. That's the, the authority we have. It's amazing, he says. Don't you realize that we will do that someday? The point is, God created us to rule over all his creation for him, and he is determined 
to bring that about. But let's think about that. Let's think about that. God has delegated his entire creation over to us to rule for him. You put everything under the feet. Now, why would God do that? Why would God do that? I mean, we human beings don't generally act that way, do we? We tend to want to, um, to get more authority and power for ourselves, to hang on to it. We don't want to give it away to others. I mean, we tend to use our authority and power to get our own way. That is why we're constantly, sometimes, at war with each other, fighting with each other. It's a battle for control. My way is better than your way, so get in line. <laughs> and when we do have the authority over others in a given situation, we can tend to be sometimes controllers and micromanagers. You do exactly the way I want it to be done. And just to let you know, I'm watching you. <laughs> when I was young, as a child, I remember we used to play these the different games. And one game uh, was we used to uh, push each other. There used to be a stump, in the, in, uh, and, and a big stump that you could crawl up. I could climb up and, and stand top of. And we used to uh, push each other off. And the one who would stand up on top would sing this song. I'm the king of the castle. You're the dirty rascal. Has anybody ever heard that song before? Hey, Ron put his hand up there. I, I think I heard you hum it not too long ago, actually. It's good. I'm the king of the castle. You're the dirty rascal. Hey, so it wasn't just something we made up. It was something that was well-known, I guess. That's the story of human beings, isn't it? But that's not the story of God. But, uh, you know, if, if God, if God has all authority and power... How do we naturally think he would treat us, right? I mean, that's the way we are. If God has all authority and power, well, what would we think he would be? Well, we think he would be a controller, a power player, a micromanager, just manager, just like us. That's only natural, right? Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts. Absolutely, right? So that is why David in Psalm 8 was so shocked. God created human beings not that he could rule over them and boss them around. Oh, he's still God, all right, that's for sure. But it is his desire to delegate his authority over his entire creation to us as much as possible. You put everything under their feet. It shocked David. Why would God do something like that? In the kingdom of God, the goal is to delegate our authority to others as quickly and as safely as we can. It's just like parenting sh should be, anyhow, and I think most of it is. When children are small and unwise, we have to exercise authority over them for their own good, or they can end up just destroying themselves, right? And we protect our children, and if necessary, give our lives for our children, just like Jesus did for us. And as our children grow in wisdom and love over time, our goal is to back off as quickly as we can and delegate more and more authority and decision-making to them, right? And then when they become parents, when they become parents, well, they'll do the same for their children. And whatever leadership position we're in, whether at work or in church, we need to have that, we need that same kind of mindset, that same kind of goal delegate our authority as much as possible trust others as much as possible let them develop their leadership skills as much as possible delegate 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 trust 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 that's how the kingdom of god works listen to this satan controls but god delegates so in Psalm 8, David worshipped God for, I'd say, for two different reasons or two different ways. First, David worshipped God in awe. He looked at the creative power of God in the skies, right? When I see the moon, the stars, etc., you put in place. What an awesome God! What a powerful, awesome God! How puny we are in comparison to you. God is infinitely higher than us. And will always be infinitely higher than us. This gives David 
a sense of reverence towards God. But second, there's another reason, another way that David uh, worshipped God. David worshipped God not only in awe, David worshipped God in love. He says, can you believe that God Almighty created us to rule over the rest of his entire creation? He trusts us. He wants to develop us. He wants us to be make creative decisions ourselves. He wants us to learn by our mistakes. You know, God may be king of the castle, but he doesn't treat us like dirty rascals. Instead, he invites us up to his throne and not only says, rule with me, he says, rule for me. David sees that God is not a tyrant, not a micromanager, who is on our case constantly, but instead, a generous God, so loving, so humble, so kind, so trusting. When David sees that, his heart is softened in love towards God. And so he worships God, not only in awe, but also with heartfelt love. It is, the, listen to this, it is the love and grace of God shown to us that softens our hearts towards him. Can you imagine, can you imagine the angel saying to God, uh, you're going to delegate the authority of your entire creation, including us, over to mankind? What if they muck things up? What if they muck things up? God would say to them, it's worth the risk. I choose to trust them. Who ever heard of a God like that? Well, sure enough, as we all know, in spite of God's great trust in us, something went wrong, and as a result, God has not yet been able to entrust humanity with everything. That's what he says in Hebrews 2.8. Yet, he says, at present, we do not see everything subject to them. The reality is that human beings are not ruling over everything yet. We can't even rule over ourselves yet, <laughs> let alone everything else. Why? Because even though God first trusted us, we did not trust him in return. Satan got into the scene and started trash-talking God to Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve turned against God. Genesis 3. Now here's a, uh, 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 yeah, here's, here's my own words of what Satan said in Genesis 3. You can check it out yourself. I'm adding a few words here, embellishing it a little bit, of course. Imagine Satan saying this to Adam and Eve. Did God say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? That's what he said. You can't eat from any tree in the garden? Well, he's so restrictive. You can't do this. You can't do that. What a tyrant. What a controller. What a micromanager. He knows that if you go your own way and decide for yourselves what is good and evil, well, you'll be like him. And he doesn't want the competition. He just wants to rule over you and boss you around. He's just using you. Don't let him do that. You can't trust him. And so... Mankind stopped trusting God and went their own way. In a sense, humanity declared war on God. Because we stopped trusting God, God could no longer trust us. And I can just see an angel turning to God and saying, See? <laughs> I told you that might happen. You took a huge risk trusting them. Now what? And God says, I'm going to send another man in the future who will battle Satan and destroy him and rescue humanity and restore humanity to rulership over all my creation. Genesis 3.15 is where he said this. And I got the message, uh, the, uh, the message here. And... Uh, it's a bit of a paraphrased translation. But God said to Satan this. He's talking to Satan. I am declaring war between you and the woman's offspring. 
He will wound your head. Wounding your head is a fatal blow. And you'll only wound his heel. That's what God predicted right away. And that man who was born of a woman and not from a man (laughs) turned out to be Jesus. As God, he took on the body of a human being 2,000 years ago. He and Satan were at war with each other from beginning to end. Satan thought he had won at the end when he manipulated Christ's crucifixion. But Jesus couldn't die because he hadn't sinned. So why did he die? He died because he took all the sins of humanity and the rebellion of humanity upon himself. And he died in our place so that we could be forgiven and reunited to God in peace. His death resulted in the freedom of humanity from Satan's control. And when Christ arose again from the dead, all of humanity rose with him to a new life, a new humanity. Like humanity was supposed to be at the beginning, right? To rule over all God's creation for him. Through the death of Jesus, Satan only managed to bruise the heel of Jesus. But Jesus was able to crush his head. Well, the rest of Hebrews 2 tells us how God is in the process of rescuing humanity through Jesus. We read in Hebrews 2, 8 to 9 now. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to them, to man, right? But here's what we do see. But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while. Yeah, when he became a human being, he was all the restrictions of a human being on earth. For a little while, he was lower than, lower than the angels. But now, he's the one crowned with glory and honor. That's the, the phraseology of Psalm 8, that mankind was, was to be uh, crowned with glory and honor. And that happened after his resurrection, right? He rose from the dead, and he was crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Those are powerful words. God Almighty became a man, even though he was sinless as a man. He said, pour all the sin of mankind on me, and I will taste, I'll take the penalty, I'll taste death for everyone in their place. The reason Jesus, as God, came to earth as a sinless man was so that he could do that. And anyone, anyone who humbly, who humbly and gratefully puts their trust in, in the sacrifice of Jesus is saved. They are delivered. They are forgiven. They are justified just as if I'd never sinned. And then God says this, I will now begin to restore you to your former glory by delegating my authority to you as much as possible as you begin to accept my love for you and my humility towards you. God says to us, I am in the business of restoring you to the glory of your original humanity. And that's what we see here in Hebrews 2, uh, 10 to 11. Hebrews 2, 10 to 11, that's what it says. After Jesus did this, is, is, what did he do? Why did he die on the cross? Why did, why did that happen? The result was in bringing many sons and daughters to glory. That was the glory that promised in Psalm 8. That's what we were uh, promised to, to rule, the, the glory and honor. He says, I'm going to do it. I, when I die for you, I'm going to be able to bring you to glory. Back to your original intention. God's original intention was to crown us with glory and honor. It was fitting that God should make the pioneer. Pioneer means the first one of, of several others. Like right? a pioneer goes ahead of us, right? The pioneer of their salvation, it would be Jesus. Perfect through what he suffered. Jesus was the first and only human being who was sinless, holy, and loyal to God through his entire life, no matter how much he suffered. God says it's necessary that he goes through that. He needed to test. He needed a human being that was perfect in trust and obedience. He'd never seen one (laughs) until Jesus came. And Jesus suffered, even to the point of death. But he remained loyal to God. And God says, yes, now this is the human being I had in mind. This is one I can trust. And then we read in uh, the rest of that verse, the, both the one who makes people holy 
The next verse. Both the one who makes people holy, that would be Jesus, and those who are made holy, that would be humans. That's the next uh, slide. Are, present tense, of the same family. The perfected human family. Look at this. God makes, Jesus makes holy, makes us holy, and we are made holy. I think it's the next uh, slide, if you if can move it ahead there. There we are. Jesus makes us holy, and we are made holy, and that makes us in the same family as Jesus. So Jesus, present tense, right now, today, today, looking at you, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. We're, we're in the same human family now. The perfected human family. Wow. Now that's a powerful statement, isn't it? It's like, uh, and I think it's in the next slide here, uh, since I have received Jesus as my Savior, and talking about myself now, when Jesus sees me, he no longer, he no longer says, Oh, brother, there's Ted. <laughs> no, he says, There's my brother Ted. Isn't that a change? I'm in the same family now. My sins have been forgiven. Why? Because I'm such a wonderful person? No, because Jesus is so wonderful. And God is so wonderful that he would do that when I couldn't do anything. So I ask this question, are we ashamed? Are we ashamed? God's not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters, but are we ashamed that Jesus would call us a brother or sister? I ask that question. How much dignity do we have? Jesus, listen, Jesus wants to eliminate the shame in our lives, not contribute to it. It is our shame, in my opinion, it is our shame that causes our inner torment and actually feeds the sin in our lives. We feel so insecure, we're so fearful, we're so, and we get so angry when, when people don't cooperate with, with what we need to do and what have you, and we feel rejected, and we get so sensitive. And I think that's the heartbeat of, of why we are disloyal to God, why we take things into our own hands, why we sin. That's just my opinion. Um, I think of what happened with Adam and Eve, right? First thing that happened when they took the, the fruit, it said they realized they were naked. They were ashamed of themselves and quickly cover themselves up. That's what sin does. One last thought. Hebrews 2.11 says that Jesus has made us holy and that we are in his family right now. Right now in his family. And that confuses us because we still have a lot of imperfection in our lives, don't we? There's still a lot of sin in our lives, isn't there? While the Bible says that God is making us holy, I think in three different ways in, at three different times. It's a process. And I would go to 1 Thessalonians 5.23 as an example of that. It says, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you. That means to make holy. Sanctify means to make holy. It's the same word. May he make you holy through and through. That's his desire. He wants to make us totally pure and holy through and through. That's his heartbeat. And hey, listen to this. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is making us holy in spirit, soul, and body. And that process won't be completed until the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now let's take a look at each of those in individually. First of all, our bodies. Our bodies, or flesh, <clears throat> are still saturated with the power of sin, and that is why they're still dying. Did you know that? You're still dying. <laughs> I look in the mirror every day. I'm thinking, man, it's getting worse all the time. Another wrinkle. <laughs> My days are numbered. I'm dying. My body is dying. Right? My body is dying. Only at the second coming of Jesus will we receive a holy, immortal body. Not this life. Sorry to disappoint you. Only at the return of Jesus Christ, when everyone is raised from the dead, to receive a holy, immortal body, exactly as Jesus' resurrection body, by the way, we're told. Okay, what about our souls? Our souls is, uh, from my understanding, is who we are in our personalities, our mind, our emotions, our will. It is the practical way we live our lives. It's who we are as people. And in this life, 
if we look at Scripture, I don't have time to go into this stuff, but in this life, we are becoming progressively more holy as we learn to trust God and learn to remain loyal to God no matter how much we suffer, even to the point of death, just like Jesus did. The more we trust God, the more we're holy we become, and the more He can trust us and entrust to us, right? So finally, that's our bodies. No, it won't be holy until the second coming of Jesus. Our souls, well, that's a process right now as we're learning to trust God, becoming more and more holy. And number three, our spirits. What happens there? Our spirits are the eternal, spiritual, and highest parts of our beings. It's what makes us, really, separates us as human beings, separates us from the animal kingdom. In our spirits, we interact with God, who is also spirit, right? God is spirit, right? It is where the Holy Spirit lives in us. When we receive Christ as our Savior, the Holy Spirit comes into us and unites with our spirit. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6.17 says, it's where we're actually united with Jesus in one spirit. It's all in our spirits. Not our bodies, not even our personalities necessarily, but in our spirits. So when and how do our spirits get holy? My understanding, and this is my own opinion after about 50 years struggling with this, (laughs) my understanding is that our spirits came alive and were made instantly holy at our conversion when we were born again by the Holy Spirit of God. Our spirits are holy because God cannot live with or be united to sin. He made our spirits holy. If you look at Ezekiel 36 that, that, that predicts the coming of the Spirit of God and the change in our hearts, like we'll get a whole new heart, a whole new spirit, he says. Hallelujah. Now, our bodies, again, will one day be made holy. Our souls are progressively being made holy since the time we were converted. But our spirits have already been made holy. And that's why the New Testament, I believe, why the New Testament calls us, consistently calls us saints, holy ones. He didn't say, you know, the Corinthian church was a real mess. There were all sorts of problems there. He didn't start that letter by saying, to the, to the sinners at Corinth. <laughs> he says, to the saints at Corinth, to the holy ones at Corinth. They were acting so unholy, but they were holy in their spirits. Right? God sees us in, our spirit, in the spirit realm. He treats us in, in that way in the spirit realm. What an amazing thing. Ephesians says that Jesus has already entered into the fullness of humanity described in Psalm 8. Ephesians 1.22 says it this way. Look at it. And God placed all things under his feet. Hey, that's humanity. That's humanity. But he was the first perfect man to inherit and fulfill that purpose, all things under his feet. Then it says in chapter 2, verses 4 to 6, look at this, because now it's talking about us. Because of God's great love, not just a little bit of love, great love for us, God who is sort of merciful, is that what it says? No, God is rich in mercy. He, in our, he's talking about our spirits. He, past tense, past tense, made us alive with Christ. This is already true in our spirits. Even, he says, even when we were dead in transgressions, that's not talking about our bodies, they were very much alive. That's not talking about our mind, emotions, well, they were very much alive. How were we dead? We were dead in our spirits because we were dead to God in our spirit. Our spirits were dead to God before we were born again. And then he goes on to say, why? How, how did this happen? Because we're such nice people and God changes mind. No, no. It is by grace you have been saved. Past tense. Saved. Not going to be saved. Not being saved. But saved. Past tense. And God, past tense, raised us up with Christ. And seated us with him in heavenly realms. That's the place of rulership. Reigning. In Christ Jesus. He's talking about the spiritual realm. Past tense. In our spirits, we are already now reigning with Christ 
as perfect, perfected human beings in heaven. Not in my body, and many times not in the way I act and live, my soul, but in my spirit. That is how God sees me, that is how God treats me. And by the way, the key to holiness in terms of practical living is learning how to live by and walk by the Spirit, not the flesh. Why? Because everything's in the Spirit. Jesus is in the Spirit. The power of His love is in the Spirit. Everything is in the Spirit. And we need to learn how to walk by faith and how to release the life of Jesus so that it comes through us. And then the Spirit, when the Spirit is released, it He produces automatically. We don't have to try hard. He produces fruit, like fruit grows on a tree. A tree doesn't have to strain to grow fruit. It just grows from the, from the sap life that comes up, right? What does he produce? He produces holiness. The Holy Spirit produces holiness. Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, etc., etc. That's true holiness from the heart. So Christ is in the business and in the process of restoring our humanity one step at a time. May his name be praised. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your incredible <clears throat> humility and love. You created us in your image because you wanted to share. You wanted to share. You wanted to give. You wanted to delegate. You wanted to help us rule your creation for you. You're such a generous, loving, humble God. We are so thankful that you're that way. And Lord, we thank you for sending Jesus to correct the problem of sin and rebellion and the lack of trust we have for you. We thank you for sending Jesus to make it real, to make it happen. He did it all for us all by grace. And now you're in the process of restoring us to the fullness of our humanity. And we thank you for that now in Jesus' name. Amen. Have communion today. I guess <clears throat> the first Sunday of the month usually is when we have it, but weren't able to have it last last Sunday. So uh, we're going to do it uh, now. And uh, as we finish off, I just want to uh, quote one verse, <clears throat> First uh, Timothy 2, verse 5, just before we take communion, which says this, 5 and 6. For there is one God and one meteor between God and mankind, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This is now being witnessed to at the proper time. The man, Christ Jesus, is our mediator between God and man. This tells us two things. Number one, it tells us that Jesus is still a man. Did you know that? He's still a man. That's why he's able to be a mediator between man and God. He's a man so that he can represent us to God. And he's God so he can represent God to us. He's the perfect mediator, right? And the interesting thing is, you might say, well, when is Jesus going to stop being a man? The answer is never. When he stepped down to be, when he humbled himself and stepped down to become a man, it was for eternity. So that we could live with God for eternity. So he could represent us for eternity by his blood. Isn't that amazing? It was an eternal decision to step down. Amazing. Amazing. So, I just wanted to bring that before you. In the communion, we're going to... Uh, <clears throat> I just want to mention again, this is uh, maybe new for some of you. Uh, we've been doing this for a while since COVID has turned up. Um, we're going to just hand out the elements once. And uh, there's two tabs. There's a, a tab on, on top, and it's really hard to open, to be honest. I, you might have to lick your fingers to get it, the tab open. But y you open the top, and then there's a wafer there. And then you, when it's time to take the wafer, you take the wafer. And then when we talk about and pray for the, for the cup, then you turn another. There's another tab. You rip that off, and you're able to drink it from the cup and what have you so just to explain what's going on there uh, for your for your information but anyhow I want to uh, <clears throat> we want to first of all pray for the bread which represents the broken body of our Lord Jesus Christ it represents the suffering 
um, you know, he took all our sins upon himself, right? And, but we can't see that. It doesn't mean a lot for us. And I think that's why Jesus was crucified. I mean, he could have died easy, an easier way than crucifixion, right? But that's about the worst way you could die is crucifixion. It's the most painful and shameful way to die, crucifixion. He says, I want to do it that way because I, I want to show you how much. And that's just a, that's just a, a picture of the internal pain that he experienced when he took all our sins and rebellion upon himself. It's just a picture. But he wants us to remember that this, the suffering that he went through, being remaining loyal to God, his Father, at the time, and uh, that he did it for us because he loved us in order to deliver us to the place of our restored humanity and at being at one with God. So let's pray for the bread at this time. Father, we thank you for the... For the bread that represents the broken body of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we are so thankful for that suffering. We don't deserve it, but you love us. And you counted us worthy to do it. And we just thank you so much for this now. In Jesus' name, amen. I think the deacons are going to be coming for the... the, the, uh, There we go. Tim and Terry, maybe? Yeah, thank you. Take this bread. I give to you and I says this for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he'd given thanks he broke it and said this is my body my human body (laughs) which is for you do this in remembrance of me Take this cup I feel for you and I I 
I'm making with you. So take it and drink it. Each time you do. same way after supper he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant it's a new covenant in my blood do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes and all God's people said Amen. Usually in connection with our taking communion, we encourage people to remember the Benevolent Fund. This is a fund that doesn't go to any of the church budget aside from just our outreach to the poor and those who have needs in the community to be able to support and encourage people within our church, but also people outside our church who are experiencing times of need. So I'd encourage you as we sing this little bit here at the end of the song to think about what you might put. We used to pass something through the congregation. We found like it was felt like it was making putting people on the spot, some people. And so we encourage you to think about taking the time to contribute to the Benevolent Fund. Take this love. given you and as you do remember me remember me remember me Come follow me. 